So the first thing is a uh, radical idea. Another one is an invention of a new instrument. <laughs> So you had the telescope and the microscope, and they opened up worlds that we didn't even know existed. Um, the third one is the collision of radically diverse disciplines. In the case of DNA, it was X-ray crystallography, Mendelian genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology. All of those things kind of fused together into an exotic cocktail that led to the discovery of the structure of DNA. And the fourth one is due to Freud. Freud said that humans advance when they remove themselves from having to be the center of everything. <laughs> so you have Copernicus who said, you know, we aren't the center of the universe. You had Darwin who said, we're not special. And now you have people who are looking at many worlds theories of quantum mechanics and saying, you know, our universe isn't even unique. And I think that's really important because we, we do have a very anthropocentric view of the universe yeah and it limits us so if that's the case I mean how, how are we gonna find you know the next Einstein or Darwin or Watson or Crick you know how are we gonna know that we found them if we do well really uh, I would look at people who have a track record of orthodox science but who are exploring completely bizarre strange things that would turn our understanding of nature on its head uh, you know I think that the biggest quandary in physics is the contradiction between quantum mechanics and general relativity. relativity. But Julian Barber is this physicist who said, well, you know what, it's just because we have this inconvenient idea called time. And time doesn't really exist. There's just an eternal now where it's just like the movie frames are all there. We're just moving from one frame to another. And if we remove time, then there is no contradiction between those two theories. So that's an example. You know, he could be one of those people. I'm not talking about science that takes baby steps. I'm talking about science that takes enormous leaps. I'm talking Darwin. I'm talking Einstein. I'm talking revolutionary science that turns the world on its head. I gotta believe that there are Darwins and Einsteins out there. Consider this. There are seven times more people alive today than during Darwin's time. When you consider that the proportion of scientists in the population has skyrocketed, there are now seven million scientists. I gotta believe, and I do believe, that there's one of them out there who is working right now in obscurity to rock our lives. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to be rocked. I'm just, I'm just curious though, I mean, do you think that there are things out there that we will just never be able to understand? Well, I think there's this hubris that uh, we think the complexity of the universe is on a scale that we can comprehend. I wonder, right? Um, I remember a conversation I had with Marvin Minsky, and they said, Marvin, do you think humans, either individually or collectively, are smart enough to understand nature in its totality? And immediately he said, no. I have a cat that's the smartest cat I've ever had or seen, and I'll never teach it French. Hmm. It's a really novel way of looking at it, to have humility. I think that's really important in the scientists, to have humility, to respect that this thing could be way bigger than we can really understand, and not to try to say, finally, this is the truth. I mean, it's kind of exciting because it means that there's just the infinite possibility of asking questions. I mean, it's perpetual, it never ends. Right, I don't think uh, there will ever be an end to science. Well, you know, I often ask people, imagine a color that you've never seen before. And you can't do it, because our brains construct things from building blocks of what we've experienced. If you've never experienced it, you can't imagine it. You know, there are two futures. There's the boring future, which is things that are just an evolution of what's already here, changed a little bit. And then there's the interesting future, which is utterly unlike anything you could imagine. I think the interesting future is the color that you've never seen before. And so, if you look inside yourself and say, what do I expect to happen? The interesting future is the opposite of that. It's what you don't expect. Isaac Asimov said that science doesn't proceed with Eureka, it proceeds with, that's funny.
And so I think by definition, the things that are going to make the biggest difference in the future are things that sound weird. Yeah. That's why I think Einstein, what he meant when he said imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is an anchor that anchors you to the past. Imagination, that's where the future lies. Eric Hazeltine, he's been a neuroscientist, an industrial psychologist, an entertainment executive, intelligence officer, and probably the most interesting person at every dinner party he attends. <laughs>